B-Sides DC would like to thank all of our sponsors, and a special thank you to all of our speakers, volunteers, and organizers. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Orlando, uh, and today I and my colleague Ryan Shaw uh, are going to talk a little bit about social media OSINT um, without the indigestion. Uh, we called it that because I, I think um, this is a topic that has gotten some exposure. Uh, there have been you know, other talks, other write-ups, uh, some books written about using, OSINT, uh, using social media for uh, OSINT collection. Um, so hopefully, the tack we're going to take today in talking about it, uh, mostly from a defensive standpoint, um, I think will be a little bit different um, maybe than, than what you've um, heard before, or at least hopefully will we'll make it interesting. Um, so by way of uh, just introduction, some quick background, uh, both Ryan and I come from a security operations background, building, managing, uh, strategy, automation, R&D, all to support uh, essentially a blue team uh, kind of mission. Um, we've developed some custom technologies, uh, holds and patents on some custom technologies, and uh, we both now uh, run a consultancy for Blue Team and SOC called Bionic, um, where we do this kind of work and consult on this kind of work, among other things, uh, on a pretty regular basis. So um, first off, I uh, just wanted to kind of set, set the, uh, the ground rules for the talk. Uh, talk about what it is and what it isn't. Um, this talk is principally going to be about finding the value um, where InfoSec and social media meet. Um, and yes, we will be talking influencers. Um, there's really no good word for that. Thought leaders, that's horrible, right? I don't really know. Uh, but basically, you know, people that you want to uh, get information from, that you trust, that are trusted sources of good, actionable information that help you in your mission. Um, this talk is not going to be hardcore OSINT methods for Intel analysts. Um, like I said, there's already you know, a really great body of knowledge out there. Uh, that's just not going to be the focus necessarily today, although I think there will be a little bit of overlap there. Okay. Okay, so first off, um, who here is on social media, like uses it pretty regularly? The rest of you are lying. <laughs> it's okay, it's fine, it's fine. It's okay, keep your secrets. Um, so why bother with social media for cybersecurity, right? We've got all the cool tools in the world, we got Intel feeds, we got all kinds of shiny uh, fun toys, so why bother you know, going on Twitter to uh, try to gather useful information? Why spend the time? Um, in my experience, in our experience, I think um, there are a lot of smart people there, right? Sharing, posting, um, there is, uh, there's some positive discourse happening. Um, you know, so there's a lot of value, I think, to be mined um, from social media. And I think, uh, especially over the last couple of years, um, personally, again, I, I've seen a dramatic increase in the researchers and practitioners and other folks who, who really have valuable things to say um, sharing information there. Uh, relatively low barrier to entry, right? It's a relatively open community in terms of being able to access information um, and engage in discussion uh, with, with other individuals there. Um, if you don't look at it necessarily as a resource for collecting all the things, um, and we'll go into kind of the uh, signal to noise ratio and kind of cutting through that a little bit. If you understand that it's not necessarily just a green field to be mined for, for data and, and raw information, um, it can be very useful. Uh, I think it's a good place to go to understand kind of evolving uh, tactics, techniques, and procedures, uh, you know, new vulnerabilities, new methods on the defensive and offensive side. Um, it's a good place to understand kind of non-obvious impacts to your organization. So in a few minutes, we're gonna talk about uh, kind of using your threat model for whatever you're defending or whatever you're doing as a point of reference for uh, ingesting you know, information and raw data from social media. Um, and one of the things uh, that I really like it uh, for is its immediacy, right? Really long detailed technical reports and write-ups are, are great. Long form blogs are great. Um, reports and other things, you know, all very useful, right? But in most cases, that stuff doesn't come with the speed and the immediacy. Uh, sometimes, you know, for good or for bad, um, that social media does. So it's a nice kind of quick way uh, to get at some potentially useful and, and actionable information. Now. Um, 
the downside, right? There's a lot of noise there. I think all of us can understand there's a lot of noise on social media getting back to that, that low barrier to entry. Um, so, you know, kind of our approach with it is to look at it as a very large, robust data set, uh, potentially not the highest fidelity data set, but, but a robust data set. Um, you know, there are existing utilities, tools, third-party services that you can use to do things like uh, indicator scraping from social media. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, that's not necessarily our focus. Um, you know, maintaining that separation uh, between personal consumption and kind of work-oriented consumption for your intel sourcing, you know, really good idea to start to kind of cut through some of that noise. Um, trying to get to a targeted kind of following. Um, so. It's not only about cutting through the noise, um, but it's also about understanding kind of what those trusted sources of information are. What are those data points that you can use, whether they're queries or hashtags or accounts or trends uh, that you can use to, to get to that quality, uh, high quality information and data. Um, leveraging you know, embedded capabilities like lists um, or channels uh, in some of these services. Um, you know, and then frankly, like just dive into scripting, right? One of the really nice things about a lot of these platforms, although the, you know, it's uh, perhaps not as open as it used to be in many cases, is you can do a lot programmatically. Um, and I'm sure some of you in the audience have, are doing a little bit today, if not a lot, um, programmatically using APIs to kind of mine the data and slice and dice it however you want. Um, and that's largely been our approach as well, uh, just to kind of get the the most flexibility out of it. So those are all good ways to kind of manage the overload. Um, another challenge um, that we've got to navigate in this area, and, and we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about it, was bias. And there's a lot of really good um, you know, material out there on bias. Uh, Chris Sanders uh, has done a lot of good research and writing about it uh, from a kind of defender and analytic perspective. Um, but I took this just kind of quick overview uh, from a writer named Buster Benson, like cognitive bias, bias cheat sheet. These are, I think, uh, some of the most common kinds of bias that we encounter, particularly in security operations or cyber defense. Um, you know, we run into this a lot, whether it's dealing with social media or any other data set, right? There's either too much information, uh, which causes you to kind of skip over things um, or make assumptions or just focus on kind of whatever is uh, most interesting or shiny at any given moment. Um, there might be insufficient meaning or lack of context where, especially for a short term, short form social media, um, you, you see that a lot, right? Somebody just throws something up, you don't really know what the validity is, there might not be a lot of context in it, and it can cause you as a consumer to sort of fill in some of the gaps, right? And again, kind of make some assumptions, draw conclusions from you know, a very small data set, not necessarily the best thing for an analyst. Insufficient time and resources, and that kind of cuts to the heart of what we're talking about today, right? What are some of the ways that you can use automation uh, to mine the data and get meaning and get value out of this large kind of diverse data set um, and not take shortcuts, uh, not burn resources, uh, not come out with um, you know, data that's not actionable, not quality. Um, and then insufficient memory, right? We're human. We can only retain so much information. Um, so when you reach those limits, uh, it's kind of natural to say, well, you know, good enough is good enough or um, you know, to kind of disregard some of the, the inputs you've received. Um, that's just human nature. So these are some of the kind of pitfalls uh, really of, of trying to do analysis with any large data set, trying to convert it to, to good information. Um, particularly when we're using social media uh, for OSINT purposes or, or even just news aggregation, um, the particular bias that comes into play is availability bias, right? And that's basically just saying that things that are more memorable come to mind more quickly and they can cause you to make false assumptions about the larger data set, right? So I'm sure none of us can think of any parallels outside of the security community, especially in social media, where people just say things and it's inflammatory and it causes, you know, I don't know, a huge part of the population to just make assumptions about a large data set. I know that uh, none of us can think of any good examples of that, but it does happen. Um, okay, so. I promise in a few minutes we're going to start digging into the technical part of it. Um, Ryan's going to talk about kind of walking through this data set and some of the things that we're doing to, to try to kind of get this big beast under control. But uh, before we do that, I want to just talk about kind of how we approach uh, this challenge and how we incorporate this into um, 
security and, and specifically into uh, security operations. And really it comes down to your threat model. I think social media is a really good source of information uh, for kind of this external discourse, um, but it has to be somehow tied to your threat model. If it's not, you're not gonna get the transparency that you need, you're not gonna get uh, measurability, you're not gonna have any of your conclusions be aligned to you know, the business or what your mission is. And if you're not doing that, you're just kind of mining the data set just to, just to do it and see what's interesting, right? Um, you, know, you have to start off with a good threat model. You have to understand you know, how your organization generates value, uh, particularly if you're using social media to um, understand you know, how people are talking about your organization that you're charged with defending, talking about how they might target it, talking about threats that aren't specific to you but might impact you, you have to understand how your organization generates value and how that value could be disrupted or hijacked uh, by a malicious party, right? If you don't understand that, probably not in the right starting place for doing any kind of analysis, much less social media analysis. And that's really gonna shape everything you're doing from intelligence collection and applying that intelligence to your operation, to picking technologies, to actually doing your analysis, uh, incident response, you know, everything else really has to flow from that. Okay, um, and really that can impact what your use case is. So, you know, OSINT is a hugely broad uh, discipline and, uh, you know, we know people, uh, some of whom are, are standing in this audience, uh, you know, colleagues who are using it for everything from, you know, seeing who's trying to run disinformation campaigns to try to maybe game a system if your business or part of your business deals with, you know, online ratings or reviews. Um, you know, I think a lot of us are aware of kind of concerted campaigns to, to impact uh, some of those services and sites. Uh, social media is a good place to kind of mine to understand, you know, where people might be doing that. Um, you know, leaks, doxing, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, understanding maybe where people are registering, for example, you know, false accounts to try to socially engineer your employees. I mean, there are, you know, numerous different uh, use cases for this kind of work. Um, and we're gonna zero in for our case study on, you know, really kind of one specific service and one particular set of use cases just because it is so incredibly broad. Um, but we wanted to just kind of illustrate our approach with, uh, with one of these things, okay? Um, I don't wanna move forward without also, um, Acknowledging that there are lots of commercial threat intelligence services, uh, feeds, third-party sites and services, public repos, news aggregators. I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there that exists for you to do this kind of uh, intelligence collection or even just uh, analytics. Um, but what we found with most of those services, uh, particularly where a lot of the social media APIs are starting to be narrowed and more heavily monetized, so there are a lot more restrictions with what those third-party sites and services can do. Um, we didn't really get the flexibility um, that we wanted to be able to slice and dice the data the way that we wanted to. Um, and so, you know, we found that a lot of these, you know, they're very good for the, the purpose for which they're built. But if you're trying to kind of repurpose them uh, for kind of more customized intelligence collection or customized information collection, um, th there are quite a few limitations. And so it just pays to really be aware before kind of diving in on, you know, one particular third party service. Uh, for our research, we looked at, you know, vlogs, blogs, um, you know, you name a major social media site, you know, we probably kind of looked at it and, and messed around with the data set. Um, you know, Twitter, uh, we found was the, the one that I think is not only most active right now, um, at least in like a public way, um, but also the easiest to navigate uh, programmatically. And so that's kind of the one that we focused on today. I think we're gonna talk a little bit more um, about that. Um, so as we narrowed down kind of our, where our focus was gonna be, um, with doing this kind of work using some of these social media sites. Um, these are really kind of the, the key questions that we wanted to ask to drive our research. And that was, you know, where can I find the most and the, and the best, most quality original information and timely information? Um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna use this word again. Who are the real influencers in cybersecurity? And I don't mean the kind of like clever pictures that we're including in the, in the slide deck, but I mean, you know, people who really do have something original to say or contribute um, that can help you in, in what you're doing day to day. Who are those people? How do we find them? Um, it's not always about followers. It's not always about some of the stats that, you know, are right there on, on Twitter or other, other sites. Um, we're gonna talk about how to kind of get through that to, to that group of people. Um, 
because there are some that are flying under the radar. And so what are the information sources um, that are kind of under the radar that maybe you know, are not gonna be trending, they're not gonna be you know, top followers, they're not gonna show up in any of those third party lists or services. Um, but you know, in terms of ratio, like signal to noise, a lot of signal in some of these accounts and in some of these um, kind of queries that you can narrow down to. Okay. So now I'm going to hand off to Ryan. He's going to talk about kind of how we dove in um, by way of like a case study with Twitter, uh, how we dug through that data set. Thanks, Mark. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Um, so as Mark alluded to, Twitter became one of the most obvious choices for us to dig into based on the quantity of information, but also what we could find at the tail end, which is the quality of information. Uh, we took a, an approach to leverage their API, which by far you know, suited our programmatic goals. Uh, we did a mixture of local and AWS based host using the EC2 free tier. Um, I think we went over a handful of months, this really has been going on for about nine months, and we probably went over the free tier limit probably half that time to the tune of $6 a month. So we were able to do a lot of data gathering, which you'll see some numbers here in a minute, uh, in that nine month period and we were to do it at a very low cost. And we were also leveraging you know, Python as shell script, so a low barrier to entry. Uh, to be able to do that, the Python was largely focused around existing capabilities uh, for Python or Twitter's API. Uh, and the shell was a lot of cleanup uh, focused around regex. When we started to dig into the, the data, the question became, where is our starting point, right? So if you are uh, a Twitter user, or you're in security and you're considering trying to use Twitter as a mechanism to gather information, where do you even begin? So we kind of took a tact of, all right, Google, who are the top Twitter accounts to follow, right? And Google's all too happy to show you 15 blogs that have top 30, top 100, uh, and a lot of the same names kind of bubble to the top, some of whom you'll see here uh, in a minute. But then we pivoted off those, leveraging the API. You could dig into who's following those accounts, um, but also we knew of some specific accounts that worked in the kind of blue team and defense, malware analysis and IR space uh, that we then looked at who was following them and who they were following. So we kind of pivoted in a couple different directions off this and we slowly built this list of 170 plus thousand, I think over time it actually grew to over 200,000 users. So from there we grabbed profile information uh, and we started to grab tweets uh, in roughly a 200 per user quantity. And so for any given user, that's gonna stretch back as far as 200 tweets would take us. Uh, you'll see for our influencers uh, that that range can be you know, a matter of days. Um, and that you know, for some folks, it's a matter of years. So it, it proved to be an interesting study in that. Now, is that a great sample size when you're trying to assess a given user? probably not the best, and so an extension of this that we'll have moving forward is uh, broadening the scope over a longer period of time, both in terms of number of tweets as far as uh, time itself. Uh, and then actually digging in uh, from there and, uh, and seeing kind of where keyword analysis on the profiles as well as the tweets validate, are these people actually in security? Because of course, security people don't only follow and aren't only followed by people in security. So we had to then whittle down that massive haystack, uh, you know, where we had thousands of politicians that were being followed, uh, and in some cases following. We have obviously tons of media, some of whom are more engaged and I would consider in the security community, others are more consumers. So having to kind of ferret that out both through profile text as well as actual tweet text to get into just because I say I'm a security person, elite hacker, uh, you know, in my profile, if all my tweets are pictures of cats, am I really offering anything of measure in the security community? For example. Yeah. <clears throat> Not, don't pull up my account yet. I haven't cleaned it. Um, so uh, ancillary to all that uh, was actually a little... It's related but uh, extension capability that we built uh, to scrape domains, uh, and that sounds like a crawler, to g touch a single domain page, right? So hand it a domain and it's gonna go to the default page, and it's going to scrape any social media links that are on that page. It's not spidering, it's not following links on the page, so uh, it, it's a low touch thing. The asterisks there represent the fact that I did find one site that someone had in their Twitter profile that immediately reported you if you visited the domain to an IP abuse list. So I had a great back and forth with AWS about why they shouldn't be concerned. 
Um, and I said, really, no, just go to the site yourself, you'll see, and they're like, no, we don't want to. <laughs> um, so you gotta still be careful, even if you're not scraping, right, you wanna make sure you're on the right side of things. So as we dug into this, we kinda got to the point of, what is, you know, what is the reality of what we're dealing with? Um, if we're trying to get to meaningful content, there's no meaningful content tag, uh, and we'll talk a lot more about hashtags as we go through, um, that everyone uses, right? It comes in all different shapes, all different forms. Uh, different people have different backgrounds. We're gonna talk about indicators and fanging of indicators, and people use different tacks there. Um, and then people just generally don't only talk about work all the time or specific malware or threat intel uh, on their social media. So how do we actually kind of balance the noise uh, to signal ratio more in our favor? Uh, it's never gonna be eliminated, but the key is getting it so it's consumable. And this is one of the things that I struggled with. I'm kind of a goal-oriented person. I like to kind of check boxes. Um, so when I get into Twitter and I'm following even 100 or 200 users, and I can't get through everything before it says I have more messages, like that to me is a daunting thing. And heaven forbid I'm actually trying to get meaningful content out of it, not just see what the latest you know, talking point and other people go on you know, this as they retweet into the, the Twitter echo chamber. So an example of this is as I narrowed down the, the accounts to what we considered really valuable for Intel discussion, one slide share profile as an example showed up four times more than any other. And for some reason, it was this B2B contacts account that has nothing to do with security. 2,200, I think, posted uh, slide shares, most of which I think are very short. They're probably just content that someone took and posted. And it's really interesting that this is kind of the thing that still bubbles up even when you have a refined data set. So it's not gonna be perfect, but the key is if it really needs to get closer to perfect, you're gonna have to do some scripting. It's not gonna be something you're certainly gonna do in the native client or third-party client. So as we talk about Twitter, um, some user classifications uh, kind of bubble up that you'll start to see. And this is kind of what we determined. And you know, hopefully you don't kind of judge those around you. And when you look at Mark and I, we certainly didn't judge each other uh, around what our accounts are. But the, the person that we would all really like to focus around is the community builder. So this is someone who's not only originating some content and sharing meaningful things, but they're also engaged in the discourse with people. They're contributing. You see a lot of this out there in the InfoSec community where people, you know, even if it's down to the, hey, I have someone who's new to the community and they're looking for a job or I got let go, and those are beautiful stories where you see people actually engage to support each other. That's, that's Twitter to me at its finest. Um, you know, and then you kind of drop off a little bit. And it's not that these are necessarily bad roles that people can fall into uh, as far as kind of their nature, but uh, you know, the soapbox uh, person is really someone who's gonna be more just talking at people. You're gonna look on there and you're gonna see tens of thousands of followers and following three, and it's probably like, you know, family. Um, there's the ghost, which is someone who's been kind of just off the system, off the grid for a while. Maybe they were active for one period of time uh, and either life got busy or what have you and they kind of go dormant or they never were really active. Uh, the lurker, which I've certainly been for most of my time, is someone who's kind of just taken in what other people are putting out there. Uh, again, not bad things, just different ways of, of going. There are people who more consume content and then broadcast it back out there. Again, they're getting that message out, so not a bad thing. Uh, they fall into the echo category. Uh, the commentator is very similar to the echo category where you're rebroadcasting content, but you're typically offering some kind of commentary more than just kind of like the arrow pointing down this, um, you know. I've done that. Not yet. I've done that. The arrow down. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the last one, it's a kind of hard word we had in there, uh, fraud, but we do see evidence-based uh, results where people are taking other people's tweets, repurposing them. It doesn't show up as a retweet. It doesn't show up as a quote. It just shows up as original content from that person when clearly it is an exact same tweet we saw previously from someone else. And so that's disappointing. Um, sometimes that can happen just in the course of kind of cutting pacing and doing all that, I get it. But if you see it repeatedly, you gotta worry. Um, I'll breeze through this, I don't need to educate everybody on Twitter. Uh, the first four categories really are, are your standard. When you get into retweeting yourself, that's where people are generally building threads where one tweet is not enough to kind of cover a topic. Um, and or someone engages them later and they go back and they respond to their own original tweet to clarify some things. So that's where thread building really comes in. Or, or sorry, that's reply self. Uh, retweeting yourself is more just kind of like, hey, I said something important, did you miss it? Um, I, I've seen a lot where it's, hey, buy my book, right? Um, 
even our community, we see a fair bit of that. Um, quoting yourself, again, that's kind of doing the same thing as retweeting, but you're actually adding some new thought. Hey, I said this two years ago and it's still relevant. Um, and then the manual retweet is uh, really what that kind of fraud category was built up based on. So Mark talked about bias and you know, in everything we do, uh, at least work-wise, hopefully not in all lives, there's some element of bias that comes into play. And we wanted to acknowledge that in this research. Um, just the nature of the course in our original selections uh, of where we started with the accounts and then the resulting accounts that we followed, uh, we ended up with mostly English-speaking accounts. You'll see results that go outside that, but it's not a well-balanced global study. Um, the keywords and phrases that we did a lot of searching based on are well-known things. So this is not originating new keywords. It's not at this point doing natural language processing to identify if you see lead-in text, the next phrase might be some new malware family. That's where we'd love to be and that's where we're aiming to be. That's not what you're going to see represented. So it's known knowns in a lot of cases that we searched for. Um, even at 25 million tweets that we collected, it's a small sample size. You know, that really isn't that much content. Um, and then, of course, there's noise in the data set. As you grab uh, these keywords, uh, you'll be probably not so surprised at just how many other instances of these keywords. You know, if we're looking for raging panda, uh, it's shocking how many people go to the zoo and describe what they saw as a raging panda. You know, it's, we, we like to think that there's Twitter info, infosec Twitter, right, and that it's its own domain, but that's not the case, right? We get, all of our stuff gets clattered in with everybody else. So, what do we do? The most recent data set that we originated, uh, what you're gonna see in the slides, came from uh, some work earlier this month. We wanted some currency. So we have 25 million, almost 25 and a half million tweets we collected, uh, coming from 177,000 profiles. We leveraged 20, 220 uh, somewhat generic uh, security keywords and phrases, many of which you'll see on a later slide. Uh, as well as um, there's the APT Google uh, spreadsheet out there that kind of talks about actor campaigns, actor tools, uh, and actor um, groups and general names uh, of all these things. We collected terms off there, kind of whittled out the stuff that we knew was going to be way too noisy, uh, and leveraged a bunch of those terms to, again, see who's talking about the things that people would generally consider really interesting. And then you're going to get ancillary benefits by following those people. So, what did that result in? Uh, out of those 1,068 uh, terms and keywords, we got about 5 million tweets that matched, right? So, you can imagine that InfoSec, CyberSec, Malware, like the more generic terms made up the brunt of that. So, as we kind of cleaned up some of that noise, we got down to 100,000 comprised of 34,000 users. Then we dug, on, dug in a little more closely on just the APT terms and eliminated a lot of the 220 more generic terms. And that got us down to 15,000 users. And then finally we said, okay, well, who are you, who's using more than one term in these 200 tweet samples? And we got to about 6,700 users. So we said, okay, like that's a pool we can work with more closely. As we looked at those users, um, we looked at only their original tweets, so we didn't want to catch stuff that they were rebroadcasting. Um, over the last 45 days to, again, keep a manageable data set. And we looked at who they were adding, who they were, uh, what they were hashtagging, the URLs they were embedding, as well as other tweets or other traits of those tweets. What does it look like when we actually dig in? So we pull back data on the API. The API does not serve data like this. You've got the tweet at the bottom. That's how you would see it in your browser. What you're seeing up top is basically our, our uh, flat file data store of that same tweet. So why the, why the delimiter of uh, pound tilled pound? Uh, it goes back 15 years where we were working in data sets and that's one of the few things I found that would never show up in URLs or other data that we were working with. So it just worked and it just leveraged that forever. Um, I highlighted a couple things. One, starting around where it says wrote a post tonight, right? So that's the main part of the tweet text, the end of the second line. Uh, you'll see that Twitter takes every URL in Twitter uh, shortens it to t.co. Um, they do provide the option in the API to pull back the actual URL so you can have those. And they separate those with their own delimiter, the uh, less than, till, greater than. Uh, they do the same thing with um, the hashtags. So they don't, they don't encode those in any way, but at least you have those in separate fields. Really makes digging into the data a lot quicker. 
So kind of going back to that influencer uh, discussion, kind of who are the most followed people. So just based on profile follows, you know, we had these 20 folks, and I apologize for the folks in the back. Um, sadly, I have to say that Pod2G was not on my radar at all, if you're not familiar with Pod2G. Uh, a lot of discussion about iPhone exploits, certainly a year, two years ago. So not something that was a focus of me professionally or personally. Um, but you see the range for the most recent 200 tweets from Pod2G, the range was 1,989 days, right? So not a lot of tweets spread out over five years. By comparison, if you dig in, I think the shortest one we have there, Swift on security as well as uh, Leslie Carhart hacks for pancakes, four days to cover 200 tweets. Now that's every type of tweet, right? This isn't just original content in this case. This is every type of tweet, replies, quotes, you name it. So, and, and oh, by the way, all of the slides, as well as all of our raw data, as well as analyses, as well as kind of tips on how to recreate what we did, all gonna be on a GitHub that we're sharing. It's not there at the moment. It will be uh, as we start rolling out data. I think we have about 18 gigs worth of data we're gonna put up there for people to have at, as well as the scripts to recreate this entire environment um, on their own. So some other things to kind of highlight. Uh, Schneier, maybe more of the soapbox uh, where it's only original tweets for the entire 200. So again, not a bad thing. You know you're gonna get uh, perceivable value there. Uh, you've got some folks who are more uh, broadcasters of others' content, either via the uh, retweet uh, method. Uh, you've got folks who are more engaged, um, and that's again Leslie Carhart, uh, Dan Kaminsky, um, with the uh, high levels of replying to others. So again, all kinds of different personality types represented here, um, as well as a number of things you see. That we've got a number of folks in the community who are over hundreds of thousands of followers. So as we look at tweets and kind of from a defender mindset, which is where Mark and I have come from historically, how can we derive value, right? So the, the most obvious path that people go to are, you know, where can I get indicators? That's just where people naturally fall. How can I collect more things to go plug into my SIM to go hunt for to find out I've got Emotet. Um, great. I think we all know that probably one one thousandth of indicators, if that, are actually useful to any given person at any time, certainly without any context. Um, so that's really not where we want to end up. The goal there is actually probably to have that analysis to understand what are the actor TTPs, what are some behaviors I can start to build um, rules and logic around for my SIM, my SOAR, or other platforms, and actually start to detect these things regardless of what the indicators are. The infrastructure is all going to change. So some people are actually tweeting more that top level where we're talking about Sigma rules, we're talking about Yara rules. So that was one of the focuses that we had was going into how do we get more to that actual net result. So again, there's a lot of ways you can get to that. You can do keyword searching, you can do uh, hashtag lookups, uh, you can try and just carve stuff out of raw tweets, not something you're gonna do in a native client. Um, but we found that both Sigma space rule as well as Yara space rule, right, case insensitive, provided a lot of relevant stuff with very low noise. Um, that's not to say if you then go follow those accounts, you're only going to get signal. You're gonna get whatever noise is gonna come along with that. But those are very good searches. If you go into a native Twitter client and you wanna, if you've got some value coming out of Sigma or Yara rules, those are searches that you can do that are probably gonna have a lot less false positives than you're gonna find other places. Um, as you get into blogs, obviously you're gonna write up, and so this is kind of coming off uh, the side from Twitter, um, but as you look at folks who are writing good content in a blog, their Twitter accounts tend to echo when that content is available as well as some findings actually in there. So another great source to, to have those write-ups. As well as getting into indicators and raw analysis, easier in theory to come by, uh, looking up uh, certain types of uh, tags such as C2 colon, IOC colon, uh, or specific keywords for malware families. Uh, you know, if you look at NJRAT, Scumbot's uh, Twitter account is gonna come up and that's, you're gonna see them, they skewed everything because they use not only the C2 uh, tag, but they also use malware families, so they, they show up um, as really high 
on our list, um, as well as looking at sandbox URLs. So if you're interested in kind of seeing what's going out there in the sandbox world, uh, there's a lot you can do to search there. All right, a lot to actually get more here. So what are some actual numbers? So over the last 45 days of content, we kind of trimmed our content number down to keep it current. Uh, again, looking at only original tweets, you see some basic numbers around a few searches. So you got 331 hits for Yara, 70 for Sigma. Um, out of those, 250 different users made up that 401 hits. Um, and then there were 374 embedded URLs, right? Typically, when you get a hit on a Yara rule or a Sigma rule phrase, the URLs are not, you know, go shopping at Amazon. It's something, probably a write-up or something meaningful. So there's good content here, again, 374 um, URLs in the last 45 days. So here's a pretty high signal ratio. Um, as far as those uh, tweets, what were the hashtags that came up most frequently? You can expect hashtag Yara. Um, malware, noise. Uh, Defer, pretty good. Sigma, good, no noise. Um, you'll see in a minute. Cybersecurity noise, infosec noise, threat hunting, better. APT, hit or miss. Um, better with a number attached to it. Uh, SIM and security, again, hit or miss. I threw this out there because I thought it'd be interesting. Out of those URLs, kind of what was being linked, you see some virus total uh, things. You see SOC, SOC Prime is a big player, certainly in the um, Sigma rule space. Um, the GitHub accounts. Tons of people are moving to using GitHub more as a social platform, right? And I say moving, there's people that have been doing this for a number of years. So certainly when you're getting into Yara and other rule logic, uh, write-ups and other things, GitHub is huge. We're gonna dump a whole slew of GitHub accounts. Um, at first, it's probably gonna be more exactly that, a dump. Uh, what we're gonna look to do is actually navigate those and break them down by discipline. And so all of our content, that's where we're looking to go, is actually to have people go, okay, I'm either new or I'm working in a certain discipline or I'm looking to move to a discipline. So being able to go in there and say, okay, I'm looking to get into Defer. So here are things specific to Defer, slide shares, you know, sli uh, speaker decks, speaker broadcasts, um, you name it. We're gonna aim to have our GitHub kind of tie back to those things. Uh, if you are focused on IOCs, so not something, uh, again, Forget all the bad things we just said about yeah. IOC scraping. You guys, you're doing great work. It, <laughs> it's, you know, a volume thing. So with that in mind, trying to keep those numbers down. Um, when you look at fanging of indicators, which is a great way to keep them from just being, you know, uh, red flagged by any number of systems that might already be aware of a given indicator. Uh, the most common things we're seeing are bracket period, bracket, bracket D, bracket, HSXP, right? So simple ones there. The tag C2 and IOC. You see some numbers around the volume used there. Uh, very similar numbers, uh, 324 actually on the URL count. Um, so, and that, I think that actually is off or low. Um, but who is using those things most frequently? I mentioned scumbots. So again, we had 200 tweets max from every account. So clearly we're getting some redundancy in scumbot, scumbots account, uh, and that's coming from both the use of the C2 as well as um, some fanging. Uh, you see a number of other good accounts. These, again, are pretty good signal accounts uh, if you want to be following. We've got some lists that you'll see later uh, that are tagged or tied to my uh, Twitter account, so you can go look at those and pull those. Um, I recommend the one that is tied to this, the IOC and fanging indicators tag. Um, you're probably gonna get a little more noise if you go to the one that's actually focused more around the Yarn Sigma rules. Uh, I would actually do those searches explicitly. Um, a little bit different when you look at the FQDNs. You're seeing a little more sandbox activity. Uh, you're seeing the pace bins, um, some fish tank, a lot of fish uh, activity. And the hashtags, again, you're getting a fairly generic set of hashtags early on, but then you start to get into some malware families, and those can be valuable. You know, hashtag rat, your mileage may vary depending on the country. Um, you know, but I think certainly as you get into LokiBot, uh, Agent Tesla, those type of things, they're gonna be more valuable uh, to dig into. To that end, so this is, you know, the scale is based on uh, prevalence um, for kind of those threat hunting keywords. So this is largely that APT Google spreadsheet, spreadsheet terms uh, extended slightly. Um, some things get skewed, APT1234 all get skewed because if I search for those, 
I'm going to catch APT 11 through 19 as part of APT 1, right? So APT 11 and 19 will have their own numbers, but APT 1 will be the collective of all of them because of how the regex was working. Um, even in scripting, you're going to run into some challenges there. Uh, fortunately, there wasn't too much noise out there for fancy bear. Um, but there's a lot of value uh, to actually be found out there. Looking at sandboxes, I thought this would be an interesting study. So there's probably, I want to say five, six, seven more uh, sandboxes that are live out there, um, and, and probably even more than that. They're not getting tweeted about, certainly not recently. So over the last 45 days, the left two columns kind of cover sandbox mentions. Uh, the right side is across the entire data set. So again, for some users, that's four days. For some users, that's five years. So you will see some inflated numbers when you go across the full data set. One interesting note was recently um, that any run is coming in about 720 uh, mentions, as, whereas virus total is uh, 511. Historically, virus total was much higher than any run. So I don't know if this is a trend that people are moving more to any run as far as sandbox, um, but it seems like at least in, in recent times that is more the case. Uh, you'll you also see some of these more fringe ones down the bottom that we're doing more specific analysis around Android, PDFs, etc. Those have kind of dropped off the radar. There's some country specific ones in here as well. Um, there are probably many more uh, that we didn't hit just based on our user base and our ability to get through translations. When I talked about generic search terms, uh, one of the things that you're going to see is uh, the prevalence of malware. Um, you know, any media story, of course, that's going to talk about InfoSec is going to have malware that just shows up. So these things all get kind of inflated. So the value for the keywords here is more the ones that are hiding in the back. It's things like uh, B-sides, um, threat hunting, DEF CON, uh, the ones that are red team, they're tiny ones that I can't even see. I'm going to make all this available so you could actually look at the numbers. But it's, this is more, your mileage may vary, so be aware of what it is that uh, you're looking at. So searching for a hashtag malware um, certainly is going to bring back our good marketing friends' um, work. I think the peak for hashtags in one tweet that we have is 47. Uh, this is not quite there. But there are a number of accounts out there, certainly small consultancies, many of whom are overseas, um, and I, don't, I can't speak to how much work they're actually doing, um, that use this as a means by which to get views, right? And so that, unfortunately, hashtags are not this pristine thing that are protected. It's something that the well is very quickly poisoned. So you gotta, you gotta kind of pick and choose. Um, is that a means by which that if I'm a bad person, and I'm not saying, by the way, that these are, um, that I could, if someone's starting to leverage hashtags surrounding what it is I do, you know, so if I don't want people creating Yara rules and being able to easily share them, uh, I'm sure that there is this nice woman named Yara who has Yara fan uh, following her and posting pictures. Um, but hashtag Yara, trust me, you're going to get a lot of noise if you try and search that. So unfortunately, while it does show up in legitimate things, it's overwhelmed by the noise that's out there. <coughs> Same thing for Sigma. Apparently, Sigma is something having to do with camera equipment because there's a wealth of uh, Japanese photography that's hashtagging Sigma, FP, and Sigma. So kind of circling back to our kind of well-known friends, how did they perform when we looked at those kind of 220 uh, malware uh, or security keywords, as well as the 880-ish um, APT-based ones. You see the left-hand column, we got some decent hits, you know, some surprises uh, at how low the numbers are. But when we talk about things that, again, from a defender perspective, things that kind of show a level of technical acumen as far as what you're doing in your day-to-day -day work um, and what you're actually sharing in the relevancy and currency, it's really almost negligible. And so I, there were so few, I was like, I might as well show them. So uh, on the Kaspersky side, Turlin, is that bureaucracy? The bureaucracy, boxy. Um, and Schneier, Cloud Hopper, not Petch and Triton. So again, context, I'm not even sure, potentially proning to, uh, to additional write-ups uh, in those, but not a whole lot of discussion if your focus is high-end research against uh, advanced threats you may want to look beyond this. 
plenty of value in those Twitter accounts. That's not what I am trying to say. So one of the things, I, we mentioned that there is no template when people share. Um, but what we're seeing, and we're going to work to try and help shape that and, and change it. So uh, I, I'm not trying to malign poor Josh Meltzer. Um, we hired him years ago, great guy, great, great account to follow. But this is an example of he really started to get going on Twitter and, and blog posts recently on the, the work he's doing. And as part of that, one of the people responded, hey, by the way, instead of the, the bracket D bracket, if you're going to fang your indicators, use bracket period bracket. YouTube will just auto ingest that, take the brackets off, and it'll just go. Um, and so Josh quickly changed his behavior. So we're seeing some good kind of feedback to help shape things. I think if we got to more standards, both in how tools were able to work with things like fanged indicators, um, but what would be really more helpful is if you're going to include indicators of various types to use certain labels or tags, um, and then to hopefully try and do that in a way that we're not going to allow that well to get poisoned um, by non-security things. Um, it's good. So we're seeing a lot of uh, kind of positive peer pressure to get us where we need to go. Okay. Uh, so just to kind of wrap things up, um, you know, hopefully uh, we've kind of highlighted some of the differences in terms of uh, you know, formats and use cases and analytics and consumption between kind of these um, more non-standard social media data sets and something like you know, an Intel feed that might be in a very standard format and meant for uh, programmatic kind of consumption and processing. So um, you know, for us, ideally, being uh, on the defensive side of things, you know, this is all great. Doing research uh, is great. Understanding things and discourse and discussion, all great. But I really, at the end of the day, I want to get as fast as possible to information that's actionable for me uh, that I can use to dump straight into my operation, whether it's, you know, rules, like Ryan said, playbooks, um, you know, queries, hunting methodologies, things like that. So, you know, um, we're going to be sharing, as Ryan mentioned, a, a bunch of resources, I think, to, to kind of help folks do that. But once I get my, you know, my, my list down of, of uh, sources that I trust, of queries that uh, have very high fidelity, good signal to noise ratio, you know, now what do I do? Um, and really this is where you can kind of pivot and turn into your more traditional you know, cyber threat intelligence, operationalization, processing kind of workflows. You know, prioritize the intel that you have, um, you know, validate it, contextualize it pivot if you need to, um, create those, con those uh, pieces of custom content, those playbooks, um, so they can be operationalized kind of in your technology. And then ideally, you know, share back. I mean, that's the great thing uh, about these platforms. Sometimes it's a great thing. Um, you know, you can share back with the community. Uh, hopefully with some of the data points that we've shared today, uh, those of you who are, you know, posting research or posting indicators or posting other, you know, analyses, raw data, um, you know, there's some kind of more effective ways to do that and maybe less effective ways to do that um, where you can reach, you know, a broader audience and, and kind of get the most feedback. Um, but hey, you know, wouldn't be a party if you guys didn't leave with prizes. So. Um, we're going to be posting, like we said a few times now, uh, a lot of you know data from from some of this research, some of our scripts and queries, follower you know lists, resources um, to the Bionic GitHub. Um, we have to you know get it clear from legal and export. No, that's true. We just haven't done it yet, um, but we'll do it uh, very shortly, probably in the next 24, uh, 24 hours. 12. 24 to 48. 24 to 48 hours. Um, 18 it'll be posted. gigs of data in the raw. So a lot of the stuff will get out there by tomorrow. Uh, and then some of it's just going to take however long it takes GitHub to accept that. Right. Um, you know, in addition, one of the things uh, um, on Ryan's Twitter, um, he's got, you know, Twitter lists of followers. Uh, Born out in large part of some of the research we've done here, we're sharing that social scraper for domains that he mentioned, where you can pull out you know all the social links without spidering entire websites. You know, just little things that are, are kind of handy to have. We've talked a lot about Twitter today. Um, again, principally because it was the easiest to kind of illustrate. Um, you know, kind of digging through the data set, and there's a lot of like interesting data there to look at. Um, but also, you know, we found, I'm sure I don't need to tell many of you this, you know, there are a lot of great Slack communities out there. That's another fantastic resource people don't always think about, don't always look at first. A lot of those are kind of closed or invite only, but there's a lot of good stuff there. Um, you know, news, um, news aggregation sites, 
Here are some examples of some that, that we find particularly uh, valuable um, in terms of like aggregation and providing actionable information. Um, you know, even now, like Twitch is getting into the game um, with a lot of like instructional kind of uh, tutorial kind of videos on there uh, that are really good. So if you're kind of in that social space and you're interested in pursuing that more or, you know, looking for more resources beyond going into Google and typing like how to cyber, um, you know, or something like that, there's some lots of good resources out there. Here, here are just some examples. Okay. Um, future plans. Um, you know, we're, we're gonna kind of continue this research. Um, I think there's a lot that we could do here um, that we just haven't gotten to yet because, I mean, quite frankly, there's so much data and there's so much stuff and there's so few standards in terms of how, you know, our little niche is discussed and presented. Um, you know, there's, that's kept us busy for, for quite some time. Um, but we're gonna continue to maintain the, the projects um, and part of, you know, us sharing them is, is obviously, you know, we love contributions and, and collaboration um, but definitely plan to continue making refinements to kind of what we're doing and making it more specific and actionable. Um, and so, you know, welcome you to, uh, to come find us. We're also on Twitter. Um, uh, you know, my feed is um, one of those um, mixed, you know, you're going to hear like InfoSec stuff. Um, be like, I watched Watchmen last night. It was awesome. And like, you know, there's going to be all kinds of stuff. But uh, yeah, feel free to uh, hit us up and ask any questions either now or, uh, or later. Thank you very much for coming out today. Thanks. <laughs>